Also with regard to uh, possible causes of that, I sent out a reading assignment last Saturday and the I can't, faculty center was being very obscure that morning but I got Gmail bounces from about 30 accounts that said mail couldn't be sent to that account. Did everybody get an email from me on Saturday? Anybody not get an email? Everybody got email. Okay, so it was faculty center being flaky then. That's good. I'm leaving the doors open here unless it gets too noisy out in the hall because there doesn't seem to be any perceptible airflow in this room if the doors are closed. <laughs> and the humidity goes up and I start, you know, wilting and everybody goes to sleep. So um, unless it gets too loud, if it gets too loud, feel free to close the door. This is in fact ECE 4760. Uh, my net ID is BRL4. You can find me anytime in 214 Phillips, right down the hall. I try to keep a full candy dish just in case you need sudden calories for, to, to get through a lab. All of the information for the course is on the website. You can Google 4760 and the top hit will be this course. Uh, so, you're going to want to spend a little bit of time reading this page in the next few days to find out where information is. In particular, you might want to look at the homework assignment for, for the first lab, which starts next week. The Dates for each lab are given on the line with the lab assignment. The homework is due at the beginning of lab one, so the first homework will be next Tuesday for the Tuesday people, Wednesday for the Wednesday people, and so on. You're going to want to look at that soon because it would be good to ask questions. First lab will be, as I said, next, starting next week, next Tuesday. There is a policy page which we'll talk about in a minute, which is the, effectively, the contract you're signing by taking the course. It's what I expect you to do in the course. There's a few things you may want, you're going to read, you're going to have to read. The may, I found it when I was trying to figure out this architecture and, and write examples, I found that I needed three documents all the time. One was the 32MX2 data sheet, which gives the gory details of, of the electrical properties of the chip, which you're going to need for lab one, or for homework one. <laughs> The peripheral libraries, which is the set of mostly macros and some functions that, that abstract the registers into C-friendly syntax. And the PIC32 reference manual, which is a monster. It's about 1,300 pages and describes in detail how every peripheral on the chip works including the timers, there's five timers, the compare, output compare units, the input capture units, and probably the most complicated peripheral, which is also of course therefore the coolest, is the direct memory access controller. So DMA is a coprocessor that is capable of making bus transfers between memory on its own with no, no CPU interaction. So for instance, you can have 
the A to D converter set up to trigger a DMA burst which reads the, a, the ADC into memory with no CPU cycles. That's cool. We'll talk more about that. You'll use that in one of the labs. There's a video game. I haven't talked about the labs yet, but let's just look at those. First lab it is all about uh, handling time. It's a capacitance meter. Second lab is a DTMF dialer, a dual tone multifrequency dialer with some speech synthesis. Uh, third is a, a, a video game on the on the liquid crystal display that we're going to give you and uh, loan you and uh, that will include DMA sound production for performance. Then a motor tachometer controller, uh, PID controller and then finally five weeks for final project design. We'll talk a huge more about, all, more about all of this over the next uh, few minutes. By the way, stop me at any point if you have... Ooh, this didn't refresh. That's better. Uh, if you have any questions, stop me, please. I would rather, much rather answer questions than drone on. There are five TAs. They're listed here with their net IDs. There are the assignment of the TAs to the sections are here. I tend to use military time because people will say, well, you meant 8 a.m.? So, so uh, these are, that's f uh, 4.30 to 7.30, 1.30 to 4.30. HTA, in addition to running a section, also consults for one section. So, Tuesday through Friday right now, we're going to have these hours for consulting. You can stop by the lab. I'll be there three afternoons a week. I'll be there Wednesday afternoon. There's no lab scheduled Wednesday afternoon. But I'll be there all afternoon hanging out. I like the place. And if you want to come by and ask questions, you want to work on the project, feel free. In fact, for most of the labs, the lab is not full or even half full during the standard lab time. People who are signed up for a lab get priority, but everybody else can come in and work during those periods. And you're going to find that you can just barely, if you're really, really organized and you don't waste any time, you can just barely do lab one and two lab periods. I'm going to expect, this is a four credit course, all of the work is lab work. I would expect nine hours a week in lab from you. Up until the time of the final project, at which time I expect 12 hours a week in lab from you because there's no lectures. So, it's a project course. Project courses are not less work than courses that have tests. But uh, we're going to have the lab open a lot. If you find that you need it, you probably will. I'll probably open up the, the lab on Monday morning. I can't open it on Monday afternoon because 2300 is in there. Uh, <laughs> Tuesday afternoon, same deal. Tuesday morning, I can open it up. Most of the rest of the time, I'll try and keep it open. I try and keep it open a lot. Everything interesting happens in the lab. I can sit here and, and tell you all day about how to hook up a transistor, and until you burn your fingers on it, it doesn't make any sense. So everything interesting happens in the lab. Any questions?
There's no particular text. You will mostly be looking at the web pages and the PDFs that I've linked up here. Let's go back and look at the policy page a little bit just to see what I'm going to ask you to do in slightly more detail. You should read this carefully. 3140 is the only prerequisite. Really what I'm getting out of 3140 is concurrency, multiprocessing, use of peripherals, I.O. ports, and a little bit of C programming. <coughs> this is a design course, so we're going to help you build stuff. We're going to give you a specification of what we want you to build, but we're not going to tell you how to build it. That you can figure out, and there's all kinds of correct ways of building stuff. So you have to figure out a correct way of building it. There's, towards the end of the semester, we're not going to necessarily have lecture. And the only way I'll be able to communicate with everybody for, say, bug fixes or scheduling is by email. And so, Part of what you're signing up for here is to actually like read email and every day. And I know you get spammed by the university <laughs> and, and, by, and MN students get spammed by Scott Coldren. I get spammed by Scott Coldren. <clears throat> but, but you really need to read the web page every day. You'll be held accountable for anything I email 24 hours after I email it. It's a CDE. I expect you to be able to remember and use everything you've learned at Cornell. We're going to do some differential equation modeling. We're going to do some vector physics. We're going to do some, uh, um, some logic. And of course, you're going to find solutions on your own from the specification. You're going to want to read this for the details, but basically the grade is based 50% on four lab assignments and 50% on the final project. Of this 50%, the lab is going to be based one quarter on, or actually 20% on how ready were you to do the work when you came to lab, 30% on how well it worked, did it meet all of the specifications that we gave, and 50% is how well you wrote it up. So writing is a big piece of this lab, this course. Lab reports are due at the beginning of the next lab period. You have to, even if you, some people, a few people will finish the first lab in three hours. And at the end of the first lab, they'll say, I'm done. You still have to come the next week. Even though there's a second lab period for lab one, you have to come to the second lab period for at least a couple of hours, start on the next lab. It's never too early to work on the final project. Oh my God, who's got an idea for final projects already? All right, one, start thinking. And the best way to plan for a final project is to ask yourself, what about your life outside of this course would you like to incorporate into the course? Do you like music? Do a musical project. You like riding a bike? Do a bike project. Take something you care about, something you care about outside the class, and turn it into a project. Now we get some weird stuff. There's some stuff that comes out of here that, said, that, that, that just screams to me, we thought this up over a bottle of beer. Uh, things like a, a Skittle sorter, completely made out of cardboard. Okay, but uh, 
but there's lots of projects that are clearly related to outside interests and those are the ones that really become good projects because students care about them no late assignments laboratory work is done in groups of two or three and of course within a group collaboration is is encouraged you'll probably end up doing homework one each one of you will do homework one because you won't know who your partners are yet with a few exceptions partners have to be in the same section you are in and you may not meet them until you get to section but after that all assignments are done as a group one homework for the whole group one lab write up for the whole group clearly within a group you're going to collaborate between groups you're not and there's some examples on this page if you if for any reason you believe that you were unfairly graded you have one week from the time the assignment is handed back to ask for a regrade there's some examples of allowed and not allowed collaboration between groups you can always talk in lab I'm not gonna I'm not going to say, you know, hide my monitor so that the next group can't see my code. You can always talk to people in lab. You can always share ideas about how to do a project. You can't send people text. You can't type on their keyboard. You can't wiggle their mouse. All right, so talking is always fine. But go through these. Make sure you know what the what the distinguishing characteristics of of um, <coughs> allowable collaboration are there's a section here on lab reports and some examples you might want to look at the examples to see the level of abstraction we're interested in for a report now these were based on a different architecture with different labs it was a atmel architecture instead of pic 32 so you can't cut and paste them and that's good but uh but it'll give you some idea of what the level of abstraction is that we want to see uh in the in the reports as usual the la the lab computers are in deep freeze which means if you log off all your data is gone you, there is no guaranteed permanent storage on these machines you must back up your stuff to an external server or a flash drive or email it to yourself or something but you must do that and if you have any uh, academic concerns experiencing undue personal or academic stress at any time during the semester or you have other concerns uh, please talk to me any questions about this uh, so what exactly is the difference between Atmel and Big 32 and why did you switch good question what's the difference between AVR or Atmel and PIC32 and why did I switch? At AVR, Atmel's uh, AVR architecture is an 8-bit architecture. It is now almost 20 years old. I felt that the students had exploited every single possible cycle on, 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 the, on the processor. So I thought it was time for a new architecture and I decided that going to a 32-bit 30 architecture was a fairly reasonable modern thing to do, particularly since the PIC32 in 28-pin in PDIP, which is a nice package for students to handle, is $2.50. So it's actually cheaper than the Atmel processors it's a 10 to 12 times the arithmetic throughput 
It's got really robust DMA channels, direct memory access channels, and it seemed like a good choice. Your next question is probably, why didn't I choose ARM? The answer is, I want to do this course bare metal without an operating system. Programming an ARM bare metal is not for the faint of heart. It is really complicated. So I decided that PIC32, which is a MIPS-like architecture, you know MIPS, Pan Hennessy and Patterson, uh, is, a, is a good compromise. Is that enough? What else? Anything else? So the first lab, they're just going through the labs now a little bit, talking about um, I have to get my click speed higher for the Mac. I haven't had this Mac long. I've used Windows for so long my Mac abilities have atrophied away. But first lab is going to be a digital capacitance meter. And all of the labs, all the labs, I try and design the labs so that they have, that they exercise some sort of cool peripheral on the chip that they do something interesting theoretically and they have a function that a student or I could recognize as being interesting. <clears throat> One of the aspects of, of the course, again, is that you're, you, you need to figure out how to use all of the hardware on the chip. You've talked a lot about software concurrency in 3140. I want to emphasize hardware concurrency in this class. Every timer is a coprocessor. Every DMA channel, the DMA channels are compute universal. They're Turing machines. Oh dear. There's four DMA channels plus the CPU. You could make a five processor machine on the chip if only you could figure out how to program the DMA channels as a, as a Turing machine. Now you talk about a hard project. That's hard. <clears throat> but in any case, first, first lab is a digital capacitance meter. We're going to be talking about using timers using the input capture facility which gives you a cycle accurate measurement of the length of a pulse. So it allows you to measure the pulse length more accurately than you could do in software because it is dedicated hardware which measures pulse widths. There's a little bit of differential equations, first order differential equations, not too much. We're going to be talking about using the comparator. There's a comparator, there's an analog comparator, there's an op amp essentially on the chip that you can use for a comparator. We're going to be talking, you need to be able to set up the LCD so that you can debug and to show the results of the capacitance measurement. And lastly but not leastly, we are going to be having you write every lab as a threaded application. So we'll have a thread package, proto threads, and you will write everything as a threaded application. This is a lightweight threads. It is not stack heavy. And the performance is quite good, but it's not preemptive. So it falls someplace towards a kernel, but is in fact just a set of C macros that makes the system look like it's multi-threaded. Any questions on that? So what you're going to do is you're going to plug in a capacitor and, the, and on the LCD it's going to display the capacitance in nanofarads and fractions of a nanofarad. Second lab, <coughs> DTMF dialer. We'll give you a, uh, a touch tone um, uh, style dial pad, 12 key dial pad, and ask you to make a device which will, when you press the button, will speak the digit. One, two, you know, some robotic, horrible voice. And then 
record up to 12 digits and then when you say dial it plays them back at high speed plays them back according to the DTMF standard so I've linked up the DTMF standard it says it's got to be it's got to be loud for 65 milliseconds it's got to be quiet for 65 milliseconds it's got to be within 1.5 percent of nominal frequency for the two frequencies the frequencies are specified there's a, the taper on the ends is specified so it has to it can't click too badly so you're gonna to have to learn how to do precision sine wave synthesis and play the two sine waves for each of the 12 different key presses the peripherals we'll be using here are serial peripheral interface connected DAC so it'd be a high quality 12 bit DAC that would be connected through SPI at uh, a fairly high bit rate 20 megahertz or so and there'll be a keypad which you have to decode because this thing is actually a, a switch matrix of 12 switches and again the display any questions so the third lab is a video game and this year, uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a game I made up, so you won't find it any place anywhere. I'm calling it Drink from the Fire Hose, which is actually a metaphor for the whole course. Um, <laughs> and, and what there's going to be here is a, is a stream of particles being emitted from the right hand side of the screen and you're gonna have a catcher at this side and you have to catch them as they fly by and the reason this is interesting is that these are not point particles they are discs that have hardball dynamics so they interact like billiard balls so you have to calculate the vector velocities and the frictionless impact of the particles and you're going to be graded partly on how many of them you can animate therefore efficiency is important since there also has to be sound effects anytime because why not because so anytime you spend doing sound effects is time you can't spend animating the ball therefore it will slow down the game and lower your grade therefore you must use direct memory access to feed the DAC to make the sound so this forces you to learn to use DMA it's a three-week lab Three weeks is just long enough that people kick back for a week and don't do anything. You will die if you do that. <laughs> the last uh, of, the, of the labs I'm going to specify is a tachometer and motor controller. So we'll have you control the speed of a fan. It's a fractional horsepower motor. We're not doing heavy power here the tachometer will be consist of a, an infrared sensor watching the fan blades go by you will build a PID controller that keeps the speed as constant as possible and changes speed as rapidly as possible under human command so you will give a command 1100 rpm and the motor should quickly and smoothly ramp up to that speed because the system because the motors are nonlinear there's some interesting control problems involved but we'll talk about that as as the time goes on and this exercises some infrared sensors and some signal conditioning and you have to worry a little bit about layout 
because the output of the infrared sensor is rather low level and if you lay the wires for the motor controller over the top of the sensor wires it won't work because of capacity of coupling so there's some there's some we're going to be dealing with analog signals in this class not digital signals mostly analog signals some digital and you're going to find that everything interacts with everything so obsessive obsessive uh, attention to layout detail is going to be important then for the last lab or the last exercise for five weeks will let you build reasonably whatever you want. There's a few constraints. For instance, no projectile weapons. <laughs> no projectiles of any kind. You can't build something that, that tracks people across the room and fires nerf, <laughs> nerf darts at them. Uh-uh. It's too hard to test in a lab situation and not make a mess. Also, nothing involving alcohol or drugs you'd be surprised what people could, uh, propose with the possible exception of a breathalyzer which could be ethically as long as you can figure out how to ethically test it not involving consuming alcohol <laughs> alright so this is a this requires some thought if you're actually going to make a breathalyzer on how to do this. Now, there's, there's, I've, I've, there's two groups that have made breathalyzers. They figured out how to test them with a turkey baster and, a, and, a, and, a, and an eyedropper. And uh, I'll leave that to your imagination. The, uh, another one that we was, a, there was a considerable ethical concern about testing was also a project that um, uh, made, made popular science, the magazine, it actually made it into print in popular science and I got a letter from the Dean saying this wasn't very dignified and it was a um, fart intensity detector <laughs> There were some long discussions about this before I let them build it. How are you going to test this in lab? <laughs> and and the and as so they did their homework, and what they came up with is that human flatulence as well as human breath has a fair amount of hydrogen sulfide. And they they convinced a German company to give them, give them a $250 H2S detector. And they're on a, you're on a budget, you can't spend $250, but if you can get a donation for it, it's okay. <laughs> so they, they, they got, the, the salesman gave them the H2S detector. They showed that if you went, ah, it, it registered significant hydrogen sulfide, so that's how it was tested. What they do on their own time, I, you know, <laughs> I don't want to know about it. So, <clears throat> but they assured me they calibrated it. And, um, <clears throat> so, there, I would call that a marginal, a marginal project. It was right on the borderline of, of tasteful. And, I only let it go through because they demonstrated some good engineering background to it before they started even to build it. They had a, they had a plan that made engineering sense. Otherwise they said no. So whatever you build has to be ethically testable in lab and uh, can't in any way be construed to be a weapon. Any questions? Can you use alcohol as a type of fuel to like power up some engines? Or so, 
<laughs> we had one project which was a, f a fire extinguishing robot, which meant they had to light fires <laughs> to test it. And the compromise there was, I said, okay, candles, candles. And even that was scary. Generally speaking, I'm not going to let you run an internal combustion engine in the lab or even an external combustion engine, but what were you thinking of for alcohol power? Just, just are you just, you're just exploring the edges of, of feasibility. <laughs> uh, I, on a one-off basis, if you can come up with something reasonable, I might allow it. There are occasionally projects that can only be demonstrated on the engineering quad like a line fall, a guy built a line following car that was this long and went like 30 miles an hour. And it wasn't suitable for testing indoors at all. So we ran it around the quad and every once in a while there'd be a GPS thing that has to be tested outside. And that's okay, but remember, these are gonna be tested in early December. And it's <laughs> cold. So, if you build something like that, make sure you can operate it with gloves on. Get back to something slightly more reasonable. Uh, I'd rather have a lot of questions in lecture than drone on about code because questions mean that you're absorbing stuff and analyzing it and cycling it back to me. I will talk about I'll answer as many questions as you can come up with in lecture. So that, uh, I mean, I like that. I think it's uh, being interactive is, is a good thing. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about, I am going to be talking about code examples. All the code examples I'm going to show you are online. They're all linked up on some web page or another. If you want to follow along, bring your laptop. No reason for me to stand up here and write it and then you copy it down, or even for me to point it out on the screen and you copy it down if it's all online. So, as you wish on that. I'm going to be in the first lab for all the lab sections. There's five lab sections. I'll be in the first lab for all the lab sections just to make sure the, the hardware is working and the TAs are tuned up and all that. But then after that, I won't be in the evening sessions because I prefer to stay married. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and so I will, uh, uh, but I'll be in Thursday and Friday afternoons and I'll be in the lab Wednesday for random questions, put your feet up and talk theory, uh, whatever you want to do. All the work is lab work. There, you have to write them up, but basically all the work is lab work. Again, it's a four credit course, 12 hours in a week is not unreasonable. There's going to be some writing to do every two weeks. So I figure on average nine hours a week in the lab is, is fair. And we'll have the space for you to do that. So count on it. All of the submissions are going to be electronic. Homework is going to be submitted within five minutes of the start of lab, preferably before the start of lab rather than two minutes after the start of lab, but before the start of, but within five minutes of the start of lab. And that will be electronic. You'll, you'll send in a PDF per group with the group IDs on it. Lab reports will be submitted electronically. And there's a couple of reasons to do this. One is to, because a lot of students don't have printers anymore. And TAs per, typically prefer things electronically, even though us old guys find it hard to edit uh, electronically. The TAs do okay. And secondly, we have to accumulate student work for ABET. You know ABET? ABET is the accreditation agency that blesses 
ECE departments that says you're worthy, you're not. And one thing they want to see is examples of student work. Every assignment. By, a ca by getting this electronically, we can, we can capture the assignments more easily and put them in the ABET file. We strip <laughs> your names off and, and put them in the ABET file for the next ABET review, which is five years away and therefore quite abstract in everybody's mind. But the word has come down, we will do this. So that's the second reason for electronic submission. Start reading about timers. Yeah, the, the, each of the, each of the, there's a more or less by uh, reading assignments by lab here. Start reading it. It's a ton of reading, but you really are going to want to know about how to access timers and capture units. You can look at my example code and that will give you one instance of the of the interface but you may want to look more generally and see what the interface can do so you're going to want to look at the peripheral libraries think about what you want to do for final projects start kicking it around try and figure it out let's see we go to 05 right or is it 10, 10. So again, we're going to, uh, if, if I had to summarize this, if they had to do the elevator pitch for the course, I would say it's electronic design using microcontrollers as one major component, but not the only component. And part of that is hardware, software, trade-offs. Do, can you, can you, by, by adding one multiplexer, can you save a hundred lines of code? We'll be looking for interesting trade-offs between hardware and software. We have a reasonable range of hardware available in lab for you to use. For final projects, I will order parts for you up to about 20 or $25 a group with 40 groups that's starting to be close to a thousand dollars and uh, after that anything above about twenty five dollars you're gonna have to spend your own money on but in any case the budget limit on a final project is a hundred dollars including everything we're gonna be looking at analog and digital signals that implies that you're going to have to consider Thevenin impedances, drive impedances. You laugh. Is, are you laughing because that's so obscure? Or, well, wait, anyways, it is obscure. It's probably far back in your training someplace, but you're going to be using it all the time in this lab. Can I reasonably drive something from this port? And the answer is, it depends and you're gonna have to know what the drive characteristics of the port are therefore the homework one will force you to read the data sheet and find out what those impedances are actually calculate them we know you're gonna destroy some hardware that's okay however you start repeating destroying hardware I saw last year gave people a, a, a little they're the cute little liquid crystal displays you put it on you leaned on it pop <laughs> broke it in half oh mine's broken <laughs> all right okay don't do it again oh yeah so so more, more likely though, I, I have seen this, I have seen, I believe it, I have seen this. VCC, there's a switch to a port. So this is an MCU port pin here. Ground. And the student will come over and say, there's something wrong with the microcontroller. Every time I push the switch, it, it reboots. Really? <laughs> And uh, 
So, if you see the system reboot, if it smells hot, <laughs> if you see smoke, all of which I've seen in the last year, turn it off. Don't ask the TA, just turn it off, then debug it. So, the safe version of this circuit, <laughs> the safe version of the circuit, of course, puts a load resistor here, maybe 10K. <coughs> and as long as this is an input, what's the input impedance of a CMOS gate? How high? What's the channel width? Oh, give me an order of magnitude. 10 to the 6th? Yeah, more like 10 to the 12th ohms. So it's pretty high. It's glass, folks. So the input impedance is extremely high here. But what if you screw up and accidentally configure the port as an output and set it high? So let's say you think this is an input, but what you really set up was an output and it's high. Switch is open, no problem. Switch is closed. Boom! You blow the output transistors on that pin forever before you can let go of the switch and you've just destroyed the CPU. So, the obsessive student who wants a good grade will put a 330 ohm resistor on every single I.O. pin before they hook it up to anything. Will it affect the input voltage you measure? Of course not, because it's in series with a high impedance input. Will it save the output? Yeah, because the maximum current you can draw through this at 3 volts is about, uh, what, 10 mils, which the I.O. pin can handle. So that's why I bought 5,000 330 ohm <laughs> resistors <laughs> so that you can all use as many as you want well you know don't take a handful but but you know use what you need you're gonna break stuff learn from it don't break it again any questions so what we need to do next time is start talking very specifically about the 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 PIC32 environment and lab one so I suggest you start reading the data sheet and the lab one description oh by the way in lab one there is a list I should have mentioned this earlier in lab one there's a list of software that you can download it's right here. This is all free software, MP Lab X version 3.05. 3.05 is the one we support. The XC32 compiler, version 1.40, and PLIB, which is the legacy library. It runs on Mac, it runs on PCs. Yes. If we have an idea of our group for Lab 1, can we collaborate on homework? Yes. Yes, if you have an idea of your group for Lab 1, you can collaborate on homework, certainly. See you next time.